So um, just a little bit about Avidan. Um, he is the founder of Root Ventures, a, a, a venture capital and private equity firm specializing in engineering companies. And um, he is on the board of directors for Particle.io as well. And um, he's an investor in a lot of different companies. And um, he is actually quite familiar with Hackaday community like um, Sharper, Print, and Plethora. And uh, his background is in computer science and hardware uh, and network hardware engineering. So let's get a round of applause. I'm turned on. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. I, I, I actually didn't know, know all those things about me because I'm not in private equity and I don't, well, I'll, I'll, I'll get into it. <laughs> so, uh, so we're going to talk actually about nothing about venture capital or startups or entrepreneurship or raising money or any of that. We're actually going to talk about what I love doing and actually how I accidentally made my way into this world. Um, and we're going to just talk about my hobby, which is hacking crazy food robots and machines. Um, so first off, so who am I and why am I a speaker here? I'm actually going to just throw these all up here. Um, so basically, we're going to walk through these six things, and it's going to kind of keep me on pace. I think I have about 35 minutes. Uh, but basically, we're going to talk about why I'm here, what I'm doing, uh, why food is a great platform for hardware hacking. Uh, we're going to talk about my big, big project, which is a 6,000-pound pizza oven. Uh, then I'm going to give you guys a little bit of guidance. If you decide that you want to get into hacking food, and food robotics. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about our newest project, which is actually a work in progress. So you can see sort of how we've been designing it. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about professionally hacking food or food robotics. So first off, a little bit about myself. So I got started uh, as an embedded applications developer back in the telco industry in the 90s. So I worked on Doxis 1.0 and Doxis 1.1, which are the spec for cable modems. Worked on voice over IP handsets uh, while at Columbia University in New York. Uh, worked on fax to email gateways. Um, I'm also a seed investor, so I'm the earliest and largest investor in Particle.io, which is very popular in the Hackaday community. Uh, Shaper, if you haven't seen Shaper tools, uh, it is actually legitimately mind-blowing. It is a handheld CNC, and you probably think I'm insane for saying that, but I kid you not, check it out. It's magic. Um, also, you know, plethora, print, a bunch of different companies that service the maker community. Um, I, I myself am a hardware hacker mostly because I love breaking things um, and like making them better. And I feel like if you can't if you can't improve something, you don't really own it. I love the like if you can't open it or you can't reflash it or if you can't. I mean, really, just at the end of the day, it's it's a pride of personal ownership comes from not just buying the coolest things, but from making the coolest things. Um, I also have a small claim to fame, which is that I am a failed Food Network host. You do not recognize me from television because the lawyers caught what we build and stopped it from ever making it to air. Uh, but a lot of the pizza oven you're going to see was actually for a TV show called Weapons of Mass Consumption. Uh, <coughs> Weapons of Mass Consumption uh, was, was phenomenal, except my, uh, my co-host lost his eyebrows. Um, and uh, the pizza oven, which you'll see, is, a, is definitely a liability. Um, and then the last thing is I, I am the founding partner of Root Ventures. Uh, we are a seed stage hardware focused fund, so we invest in low cost robotics and connected devices at the core. We invest in the picks and shovels behind the scenes, so developer tools, manufacturing tools, prototyping tools, design tools. And then we just believe supply chain manufacturing and logistics are going to get turned on their head. But that's what I'm going to say. That's it about Root Ventures. You can look it up, and it's, it's a lot of fun. We could talk about it later. But now to food. So why is food the greatest platform for hacking? First off, we use it every day, right? I mean, at the end of the day, you can build something obscure for your weekend hobby, or you could build something for summers or winters, some ski thing, some surfing thing. But really, at the end of the day, food is an everyday thing. And you could invite friends over to test on them, whatever your newest contraption might be. At the end of the day, a lot of what inspired me to create food is I like eating it. And <laughs> When it tastes really good, you end up focusing a lot on improving it day in and day out. Um, on top of it, it's super accessible, right? At the end of the day, our homes are filled with machines that are 
really insecure, really easy to open up, and really easy to mess around with. I mean, like nobody's scrubbing off. There's, there aren't like epoxy covered, you know, microcontrollers in here, right? They, people just didn't, when people were building or designing these things, they didn't think about us. And that might sound like a bad thing, but it's actually a fantastic thing because they didn't get in our way, which means you have direct access to relays. Oftentimes, you're actually looking at something that is, you know, small, easy, and cheap. You could pick it up used, and you can just immediately start hacking on it. Um, and at the end of the day, I think the real interesting analogy around food and food preparation and being a chef and, and, and creating food is that it's, it's a closed loop system, right? If you look at a chef, uh, and this is Alton Brown, because I think I, I can't deal with like the celebrity, celebrity chefs that like are bleached hair, whatever. Uh, <laughs> sunglasses on the back of their heads, I don't get it. But uh, really when you think about it, it's the perfect closed loop system, right? We are a load of, we are a set of sensors, end effectors, end effectors and actuators, right? So we use our senses, whether that's the sense of smell, the sense, sense of taste, or, or even just sight, to see what we're creating. And then we use our end effectors to adjust recipes, right? We might follow a preset program that you have, you know, PLM steps, or you might have just, just straight logic built into something. But the beauty of a closed loop system is that it's gonna adjust based on sensor feedback. So someone might taste the food in the middle and say, this is not salty enough. End effector, grab some salt, throw it in. So we can create an autonomous version of this and now we have really great sensors, actuators, and end effectors that allow us to get there. So I know it's a lot to sort of pull in and it's a little bit hand wavy and I notice I'm waving my hands as I say it, but um, we'll get there. And so I'll give you an example that we built. This was not actually the first thing we built. We had built a whole bunch of, and, and by we, I just mean me and my friends. I, I, I think at the end of the day, hacking by yourself is a lot of fun, but when you find friends, whether it's community online or community offline, it just becomes that much more fun and you push a lot harder. Um, and let me tell you, when you're building food-related robots that kick out amazing barbecue and pizza and coffee, you make a lot of friends very quickly, because um, at the end of the day, you gotta test on somebody and people just wanna eat awesome food. So we built, a 45 second pizza oven. So first off, the reason why it's 45 seconds is because there is an Italian governing body of pizza called the Neapolitan Pizza Verizona, the, ah, I forget the name of it, but they basically certify that a pizza is officially quality pizza if it can be cooked in 90 seconds. And we're like, 90 seconds, come on, we could beat that. And really, it actually led us into a pretty crazy rabbit hole of why fast pizza is better. And this is why fast pizza is better. So no offense to present company, California pizza kind of sucks. And California pizza oftentimes sucks not because of the water and not because of the ethnic makeup of the people creating it or the, their heritage or you know the Italian sweat in the dough. It's not that, not that at all. Uh, it's actually pretty disgusting, but the Italians wet in the dough. Um, but basically what it comes down to is if you're gonna cook something slowly, uh, you end up using a lower hydration dough, which basically means your dough doesn't have as much water so that you have a lot more, it's a lot more forgiving. So you might bake it in your home oven at 400, 500 degrees. You might wonder why does my home pizza not taste as good as pizza I get you know, at an awesome pizza parlor. Um, what you're looking for is actually these really big air pockets. And those air pockets come from an extreme amount of hydration, so a very wet dough that is hit with an intense amount of heat and actually creates both steam and off-gassing from a combination of the yeast and water to end up with really airy dough. And I was moving from New York to California, and I got to California and I was like, oh my God, the pizza here sucks. <laughs> And so I decided I had to fix it on my own, right? So uh, first hack was I turned my home oven uh, into self-cleaning mode 24-7. So I chopped off the safety lock, put it in self-cleaning mode, ran it for 45 minutes, and then you open it up and it's 900 degrees. And I was like, yes! 
and then my landlord was like, no! <laughs> so, so that, that oven didn't really survive. Uh, but, but really, it's, it's all about the heat. I mean, we, are, we, we basically realized that if we were gonna make awesome, awesome, awesome pizza, we had to get as wicked hot as possible. Um, so there's, there's a huge, I mean, I, the, my favorite thing about the hacking, the hardware hacking community is the overlap between various communities. And there's a developing world hacker community around uh, affor extreme affordability. And there were a couple engineers who came up with something called a rocket stove. Has anyone heard of the rocket stove? Okay, so the rocket stove is an amazing, you should look it up, I won't get too deep into it, but basically it, it revolves around secondary combustion. So the idea being, where your fire is, is actually not the hottest place. If you can successfully light a fire and get it to rise at a specific angle, you can create what's called secondary combustion. Where, this, where you know that it is super hot because there's no smoke. You have actually gotten so hot that you are burning the carbon left in the smoke a second time, and that's how you get extremely hot. So we said, okay, well why don't we take a regular old pizza oven and let's turn it on its head. So we built a frame of a regular pizza oven and started to build in these rocket stove fire boxes. And we built two of them side by side and then laid on a traditional pizza oven. And that traditional pizza oven, you can go ahead and build one of these. These are very well documented. There's a great uh, resource called the Pompeii Oven Kit, which is an open source design for building that top dome. But at the end of the day, what's different for us is we weren't gonna put any wood fire inside of the oven. What we were gonna do is put all the fuel underneath it and build that exact baffle to get secondary combustion going. So we were gonna get extremely intense heat. So we built it, but it wasn't hot enough. We got up to about a thousand degrees and we were cooking pizza in like 65 seconds. Um, and you know, that's not 45. So, we added afterburners. <laughs> um, so these are 100 CFM furnace blowers that uh, brought extreme amounts of air into our fireboxes. So we're not only counting on secondary combustion, we were forced feeding fuel into our fuel sources. Um, on top of it, you might notice uh, these yellow lines. We also brought in some propane to just, <laughs> why not? Uh, 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 we stopped at actually genuinely making real afterburners because then we would have been pouring fuel into the inlet of the furnace blowers and uh, that would have been very, very, very dangerous. Not that this isn't, but, um, and to, to control everything, we built a uh, microcontroller based system that had an H-bridge thermocouple uh, a Max 31855, I'm totally missing that one up. It's the thermocouple, uh, thermocouple chip. Um, and basically, the first version of this did not have the red and green buttons, which was a really, really, really big mistake. Um, because we just would like, we were like, oh, we'll just turn on the afterburners. And um, those afterburners created this type of heat. So that's, a wood fire, that's 1,500 degrees of fire output directly in your face. So by putting this red and green button on, we could actually cut down the furnace blowers. So basically, we were even contemplating making it automatic, so when you remove the door, it automatically killed the furnace blowers, uh, but anything we tried to put anywhere near the door just melted. Um, <laughs> it, it, was, it, was, it was problematic. Um, but the board itself is, uh, uh, it's a uh, robot, it's a H-Bridge shield from uh, Megamoto, robot, robot Power, I believe is the name of the company that made that Megamoto shield. So this was actually made a couple of years ago. And we've continued on. I mean, this is, this is the build materials uh, for, it's a little tough to see with the sun, but uh, you know, 3,000 pounds of fire brick, propane solenoid so we could basically turn on and off our fuel sources. We used canthal coil. If you're not familiar with canthal coil, it's the coolest thing ever. It's uh, a resistive coil that you wind up and it's used for ceramic furnaces. 
So the reason why I know how to build crazy furnaces is because I also build glass blowing furnaces. So when we were like, oh, 1500 degrees, I was like, that's cold. You know, I was like, 2000 degrees is what we go after. Canthal coil is the secret recipe. Um, and the beauty of it is if you want to wire up canthal coil to create a specific temperature, because it's purely around electrical resistance, you can hook it up to a solid state relay. And if you plug it into a, in a really high amperage solid state relay, because you're going to pump a ton of electricity through it. And what you're able to do is basically generate a PID loop on top of it, use a thermocouple as your feedback, and essentially hit any temperature you want. Now, we didn't want to use that as our only fuel source because wood fire tastes really good. But what we did is we were able to control the floor of the oven to an exact temperature and isolate it from the dome temperature. So we weren't burning the bottom of our pizza and we were making sure that even after several pizzas went in and out that we were able to maintain a specific temperature. So it's a little overkill, but that was kind of, it was called weapons of mass consumption and they gave me a budget and I said, I'll build craziness. So we built this craziness um, and it burned lots and lots of wood to the point where our final specs were 1500 degrees max temp and we probably think if we would have changed the variety of wood, uh, basically what we found out afterwards as we were trying to peek things out is that California woods don't burn as hot as some of the hardwoods that exist in rainier places. Um, and so there were certain hardwoods that we later found out nobody uses because they're so hard to combust. And once you do, they are crazy hot. And so we we're actually trying to get a hold of some of those, but they're like exotic hardwoods you have to buy at Rockler or something. Um, at the end of the day, we had great uh, granularity control. We were actually able to build a profile. So 1,500 degrees, we were able to drop down to 1,300 in the middle of a bake, come back up. Um, and we were, we, were, we were able to really move temperature pretty well. So we actually didn't just hit it with 1,500 for a full 45 seconds. We hit it for 10 seconds, killed the, killed the afterburners, and then brought it back up in the last 10 seconds. Um, we were down to 45 seconds of pizza. And anyone here from the East Coast or somewhere very cold? All right, so we burnt a quarter cord of wood in a single night. Like, intense amounts of wood. Um, so it's not exactly fuel efficient, but a lot, a lot of fun. So now I'm gonna give you a little bit of a practical guide for you to start food hacking, right? And I think the first step is something we hit on, which is forget about the art of food. I, I, I mean, it's, it's romantic, it's fantastic, I love the smell of food, I get it, and there's you know, something beautiful about a glass bottle of wine and a beautiful meal perfectly plated, but at the end of the day, food is science. And if you start to really peel it back, right, it's, it's organic chemistry, right? It's a lot of different pieces of how foods react to heat and to cold and to being blended and being macerated and being ground. And you, these two guys are phenomenal. If you're gonna follow somebody online, uh, Kenji Lopez-Alt is taking it to a whole nother level. He's an MIT engineer who's built an amazing career of building matrix graphs of the impact of butter on chocolate chip cookies. I, to the point where it's the temperature of the butter and the salt and how you treat, and it's awesome. Um, so he actually has a book called The Food Lab, which I highly recommend. Uh, it's also a beautiful book. And then Alton Brown, hopefully you all have heard of him. He kind of like inspired a, a, the next generation of engineers to be unintimidated by what appeared to be a French art. And what, at the end of the day, if you look at a recipe much more as uh, a set of logical steps, inputs and outputs, you really can stop for a second and say, okay, like maybe I'm not gonna be able to make my mom's pasta ragu right away, but like there are a lot of great foods that can be controlled and treated like engineering problems. So this is a great way to think about what you wanna go after. Um, making a perfect stir fry is a little bit hard from an automation perspective. Right? There's, a lot, there's a lot going on there. Whereas if you want to just start out with muffins, you can simply say, okay, I can look at the temperature of, you know, everyone says bake for 350 degrees, which is ridiculous because like there's a right time to be at 450, there's a right time to be at 250, and there's a right time to be at 300, but no one wants to complicate the program. 
they want it to be very easy to pass along that information to another human. At the end of the day, if you're building a control system, you don't care if it's 10 minutes at 450 and 15 minutes at 380 and 11 minutes at 340, which is actually closer to how you should be baking your muffins, right? You want that high heat for a rise and then you want the full cook through. So what you also then wanna do is look at the equipment you're looking to hack. So in this case, what you can't see because the sun, eh, that's not gonna work, um, is, uh, is an awesome espresso machine that has a full digital firmware package. It is running an at mega, super long in the tooth piece of garbage that is, actually if anyone does want to come and hack on this coffee machine, that's our coffee machine in our office in San Francisco and, and we're trying to uh, reverse engineer the firmware on it. But on the opposite end here, you have analog, analog equipment. So here it's actually just a manual dial that adjusts the grind, which meant all we needed was a stepper motor hooked up and we were able to adjust the grind pro programmatically. Um, next, experiment. Just like try to mess around with things you have around you. This is, an, this is a 55 gallon oil drum that I bought off eBay. Um, I went ahead and decided that I was gonna get into smoking barbecue, right? Anyone from a place that has real barbecue? Okay, awesome. California has no real barbecue. It's like the most, dis it's, a, it's another one of those pizza things where I was like, come on, like really it can't be something proprietary like that. And so I researched and researched and researched and found out that there, there is a set of steps you wanna take. You wanna control smoke flow, low temperature, humidity levels. So 55 gallon oil drum and a Raspberry Pi. Raspberry Pi uh, with actually an Atmel backpack on it running open WRT, but longer story and I'll get into that later. But basically we were able to embed sensors inside the oil drum and cook a brisket over 18 hours. And over those 18 hours, we ended up with, you know, Texas quality brisket in California. Um, so the meat is good, the meat is good here and, and really at the end of the day, you'll find that I, I can tell you that as far as their experimentation is concerned, uh, we had a lot of bad barbecue come out of this at first. Actually, a funny story is the first time I turned this on, um, I got really excited. I was like, okay, I'm gonna make brisket and, it, and it's gonna smoke for 18 hours, right? No problem, that means I can go anywhere I want. I don't have to stay at home now, right? <laughs> Raspberry Pi, it's controlling it. It's, it's connected to Twitter, so it tweets the temperature of the meat every five minutes. So I was like, I'm gonna just go somewhere with my phone and I'll just monitor my brisket from there. So I went out to dinner with my brother and uh, I was sitting at dinner with the phone out, Twitter feed up, and the temperature was 225. And it said 225, 225, 245, 265, 295, 325. And I looked at my brother and I was like, oh my God, I, I, I gotta go. Like, my barbecue has gone wild. And, and my brother says to me, he goes, he goes, Avidan, don't worry about it. That's not the temperature of your barbecue. That's the ambient temperature of your house burning down. <laughs> I drove really, really fast. Uh, but what had happened was I didn't actually account for the fact that airflow, that I wasn't controlling all the airflow going in. So I assumed I'll just let a little bit of air from an open vent, but what I really needed to do was entirely control the system myself. So I cut off all air input entirely and had a fan that I was controlling through my PID loop. And that was the only way the fuel, the only way fire was gonna get any oxygen was gonna be because I let it. So I ended up sealing the entire system from external airflow and now I nail it. Every time, 225 with actual build-in steps. If anyone's really into barbecue, there's a great thing called the uh, barbecue stall, which is baffles every non-engineer, whoever cooks with, whoever barbecues brisket or any large piece of meat. And barbecue stall actually has to do with the evaporative effects of reaching a specific temperature. As your meat starts to sweat, that cools down your meat because the airflow going against the sweating basically brings down the temperature, which means you can solve it through humidity control. So if you then get into humidity control, all of a sudden you can in insert humidity at the right time to basically break through stall. It's essentially why sweating 
on a beach in a dry place will cool you off, but sweating in the jungle where it's super humid, you find no relief. So in any event, I highly recommend just experimenting and experimenting and experimenting. So let me talk a little bit about some of the tools that we like to use in food hacking. I mean, there are some of the obvious, you know, get a pie, Arduino or particle, go particle. Um, but, uh, you know, for me, a lot of what I build is around low and slow, long term. And so having a wireless controller makes a lot of sense, whether it's a Raspberry Pi 3 already with Wi-Fi built in or using something like a photon or electron, uh, especially since a lot of backyards don't have, um, you know, don't have Wi-Fi, you end up going cellular. Uh, and then, you know, multimeter sensors, right? At the end of the day, what we need to do is build closed loop systems. The only way you can build closed loop systems is you have to be able to measure. You have to know what the temperature is. You have to know what the humidity level is. You need to know what your flow looks like, what your humidity looks like. So these are some really great sensors that we use. And then the actuators, right? So some people want to put robot arms on everything. I think it's insane. Solenoids, relays, just the basics, right? Really focus on the basics. Because a lot of your equipment, this is actually, uh, you can't see it, but it's a pressure cooker, um, which is dangerous. Don't make that your first thing. Please do not make a pressure cooker your first project. Um, but when you get to that level, it's freaking awesome. Uh, you can basically have full pressure control uh, where usually it's entirely mechanical and there's just little mechanical pops that let you know when you hit a specific pressure level or you buy one of those electrics from the store and those electrics are really built for your safety and not for your pleasure. If you want to have fun, you got to break into it. Um, so I highly recommend uh, just tear off the warranty. No one, does anyone use a warranty anymore? Like forget it, like warranty, it's gone. Uh, just don't burn down your house. Um, so our next project was coffee and this is the current one we're working on. So why are we working on coffee? Hey, I love coffee. I love, love, love coffee. Second, there's a lot of empirical data around the scope parameters. So basically, uh, at the end of the day, coffee is measured on something called total dissolved solids, and we know that we're shooting between seven and a half and nine and a half. Uh, on top of it, the pressure and temperatures are basically consistent across all espresso machines. So 10 bars and 201. Uh, you can taste at 199 and you could taste at 203 and you will realize that those are kind of disgusting, but all machines are basically tuned up for that 201, uh, except for altitude, which throws everything off. Don't have coffee in the mountains. Um, and then the last is the one variable change is the grind size, which is how we were able to basically have simple controls to get us to higher quality coffee. Um, I would also say there are some other sensor, there are other pieces of external information that are impossible to control. So external humidity, external temperature, you don't want your coffee machine to be sitting inside of a vacuum. You want it to, to deal with the external environmental variables. So we had simple to modify equipment and fast iterations, uh, much faster iterations because we have more than one cup of coffee a day. So, and then we, we also, in our workshop in San Francisco, we built a coffee bar so that everyone who comes to visit us, I don't care what time of day you show up, we will offer you an espresso. You think we're being nice, it's really because we're running an experiment. Uh, we just want to figure out, we like dialed it in a little more and we're like trying to check it out. And then the last is, I really, really, really love coffee. Um, if it wasn't obvious, I'm pretty high energy. Um, so, grinding. We took a particle and we hooked it up to a EK43. So this is one of those manual grinds. We put a stepper motor on it so we can basically tick in either direction, finer or coarser. So here's the beautiful thing. The reason why we're affecting grind is because at the end of the day, the system that we built, and you cannot see anything. So it's a dragon. No, I'm kidding, it's not a dragon. It's an espresso machine um, and then a, a grinder. I said espresso machine and a scale. So basically, 201, 10 bars of pressure, we're gonna put a consistent amount of coffee into the machine, 18 grams. We're gonna grind it at a variable size, depending on what our algorithm tells us to do. And the output, we're gonna want a specific ratio that results in this exact correct total dissolved solids. So for example, 18 grams of coffee from Ritual's last roast. So Ritual Coffee is a, is a roastery in San Francisco. From their last roast, 18 grams of in coffee beans coming out in 28 seconds 
36 grams of liquid out ends up with dead in the center, correct amount of total, total dissolved solids. And if you can consistently hit that time and that volume ratio, you end up with that exact same TDS every single time because you've controlled all your other variables. So what we end up doing, and this is where, so right now we're, we're at the point where we have one last piece of firmware to develop. And what we're going to do is have the scale auto measure and send corrective instructions to the grinder. So what that means is if the coffee came out too quickly and the scale detects that the weight of the coffee rose too quickly, it will send a command to the grinder to make the coffee finer. And if the coffee grounds are finer, it flows more slowly. And if the opposite occurs and it takes too long to extract a cup of coffee, then the instruction sent to the grinder will be to make it coarser. And that is how we end up with a closed loop system that is continuously self-adjusting and maintaining over the course of a day. So you're, actually your first cup of coffee should be your worst cup of coffee because over time it's gonna get better and better and better and better. And once it's dialed in, it should be straight, straight and to the right, exactly the correct amount of total dissolved solids. So that's our current espresso machine project. And now I'm gonna talk just for a minute about uh, food hacking professionally. So this is, I promised I wasn't gonna talk too much about venture, but I'm gonna talk now for four seconds. Um, if any of you guys are building anything in food hacking, obviously you're thinking about like, hey, should I build a company around this? Should I like become like Keurig or Momentum Machines? By the way, secret, that burger I was eating in the first slide, that one was made by a robot. I bet you guys didn't notice that. It looks exactly the same as a real, ro a real burger, right? Um, so uh, what I would say is, you know, the beauty of building hardware today is that you can get started super cheaply build, iterate, prototype, you don't actually need to build a venture backable business. You can build a regular business, like where you build a product and you sell it to people for money and then you take that money to the bank and you buy your own food for it or you buy like a house or you buy, like you don't need to be in this like crazy, like oh, we'll sell it at a reverse negative margin because we're like a services social media model and like people will like connect their Facebook feeds to their oven. Don't do that. <laughs> it's, just, it's just not worth it. And the reality is, is that there are really great businesses to be built where if you love what you're doing, that's what I would say, focus on do you love what you're doing and then go and build it. Um, and then I would say my favorite reason why is because this is the iteration of what we built as, a, uh, as the smoker controller for that barbecue. And it started out as a prototype shield that sat on top of a Raspberry Pi. So we actually did this in conjunction with a guy named Brian Malin, who, uh, uh, who is the originator of something called Heater Meter, which was originally hacking a Linksys router, which was awesome. Then we got into an even better design because we realized we didn't need all the full Linux stack, right? Um, and when you don't need the whole Linux stack, all of a sudden you're living in the microcontroller world, which is so much better. So, I mean, like, uh, I love Raspberry Pi, love Raspberry Pi, uh, but eventually, if you're gonna build something that you wanna go professional with, odds are you really need to ask yourself the hard question, why do I have a full Linux stack? Why do I need Perl? <laughs> you don't. I, I just, it's so much, and I, and, and this is, I'm sorry, I, you know, full disclosure, I'm actually a free BSD guy, but still, you know, made my way into Linux and Ubuntu and love it, but it's not built for, I, it's weird to say it, it's built for professional products, but very specific professional products. If you're going to build a B2B or B2C product, you really need to ask yourself why, and then eventually you're going to end up with a microcontroller. So you go to a microcontroller and we redid the design and actually this was a, with a guy named Nate Wyatt um, uh, who, who built the first particle powered smoker controller. Um, so this used four thermistors. So if you're not familiar, thermistors are a much cheaper way to test temperature than a thermocouple. And uh, from there, we actually went a full step further because we realized we didn't need an LCD, we didn't need a screen because it was Wi-Fi controlled, so your phone is totally sufficient. 
and that cut down on the bomb. And then on top of it, Particle offers an amazing service where you don't need to use the module. You can just buy the actual Wi-Fi chip itself for significantly cheaper. And because their firmware is open source, you just lay it right there onto the board. So the next one was Smartfire, um, which was the third guy, Mark, Mark Terrell, uh, who basically productized it um, and bundled it all up. And you can actually buy this online as Smartfire. So there's a total path to production, but at the end of the day, it's really just a lot of fun. And it's about, you know, it's about the journey, not the destination. So as much as this is great and there is a destination, at the end of the day, I think most everybody who gets inspired by this is doing it because they want to eat an awesome dinner. So thank you guys so much. Um, it's a pleasure. Thank <laughs> you.